I'd like to call our next panel up to the stage. Uh, it's going to be led by Orrin Cass, who will be joined by Ovik Roy and Grant Calder. The idea behind this session, continuing our analysis of the 2016 election, is to get us all thinking about how we should be consuming things that are coming out of the various political campaigns. All three of the gentlemen are vets of various political campaigns, and they're going to be giving us a little bit of insight into what goes on inside the belly of the beast and how we should be thinking about things that are occurring this time. So if I could just call Orrin to the stage, I think Ovik and Grant are still being uh, mic'd up, um, just to give a little bit of insight about what the panel is going to address. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Uh, I am a longtime Bain and Company management consultant, and so feel passionately that MBAs need to care more about the political process than they do today, uh, and try to do Adam Smith stuff whenever I can. Um, my own career went uh, Bain, Romney campaign, Bain, law school, Romney campaign, Bain, and now the Manhattan Institute. So I've, I've bounced back and forth between very business intensive contexts and very political intensive ones for a while and have always been struck by just how disconnected they are. Um, I, I think the best example in my mind is that in a consulting context, everybody thinks that in the area they focus, the government is destroying everything. So all the financial services consultants think Dodd-Frank is horrendous, but generally thought Obama was great on healthcare education and every area they knew nothing about. And all the healthcare people thought Obamacare was a disaster, but we're pretty sure he must know what he was doing on financial services and, and everything else. And trying to emphasize to them that maybe this was this big a disaster everywhere, um, and, and they needed to think about it a little bit more broadly than just their own narrow interest, I think was always very challenging. Um, so I think the two things that, that we're gonna really focus on today, one is just, what is it like inside a campaign? Um, me, Grant, and Ovik have all spent time both in business context and campaign context, and, and I think have all had fairly similar striking experiences in the differences between them. Um, and then also talk a little bit about what it means for people who are on a business track and how to still be involved and engaged in the political process, how to make sense. You know, when you're screaming, why aren't they arguing more about their health care plans? Why? None of them want to argue about their health care plans um, and, and, and how, from a business background in particular, to still be effectively engaged in the political process or even pursue that type of career. So if you guys want to come on up, if you're all mic'd up, um, stepping on stage first is Ovik Roy. He is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute right now. He's also the opinion editor for Forbes, uh, and he's also advising Marco Rubio's campaign. Um, and we should just clarify, he's speaking on his own behalf, not, not on behalf of the campaign in any way. Uh, but he's also went to Yale Medical School, spent time at J.P. Morgan and Bain Capital, uh, and was an advisor to the Romney campaign in 2012, and, and Governor Perry's senior policy advisor earlier in this cycle. So I think a really great breadth of experience. And the next to him is Grant Calder, uh, who was a colleague of mine on the Romney campaign had also spent time in private equity and venture capital, was actually at Stanford Business School while working on the campaign, uh, and since then uh, is now the CEO and founder of Wispio, which is a, a video sharing service, if I might oversimplify it, uh, and also a vice president of media at Mainstream Media. So again, a very interesting breadth, and, uh, and I think they will have a lot to share with you guys. So I don't know, oh, this mic is on as well. Good timing, guys. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, I guess I wanted to start with just a question for both of you, which was thinking about the time you first moved from a business setting into a political campaign. What surprised you or, or maybe even stunned you the most as just a completely different universe than, than what you'd been accustomed to? And, how did, and how did you come to terms with that? Um, but Grant, you can Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, I had always generally been interested in politics, but had never actually worked in a political setting. And between years in business school, decided you know, what better opportunity than to go and sort of try it out. Um, first thing I noticed pretty early on is that a political campaign, particularly a presidential campaign, 
is nothing like sort of the organizations that you're used to working in, right? Um, it's you know a couple of big differences. The first one is there's sort of a fuse attached to it, right? When I joined Romney, I knew that best case scenario, the organization was going to, the campaign would cease to exist in November of 2012, right? And that was true for everyone. Um, you know, secondly, you think about incentives, right? And how do you, you know, provide incentives for people, employees, right, that are in there? Um, you know, incentives in traditional business are driven sort of by, you know, you know economic, upward mobility, um, you know, finding, you know, joy and sort of being successful professionally. Those don't generally exist in a presidential campaign, right? The big incentive, it's not monetary. The big win is if you can be close to the candidate and position yourself for something sort of later on. And lastly, the people that work in these campaigns generally do this um, or have done it sort of you know, as a career for their life. And so they're not generally trained in what it's like to work in a highly functioning organization, to put it <laughs> delicately. Um, and so it's sort of a constantly um, you know, going cycle where these, these folks, they're very good, you know, generally very smart, you know, lots of hustle, but management and organizational structure is interesting. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I'll say for me there were uh, two transitions. First, there was a transition of being a business guy who started writing about policy and thinking about policy. Then there was the actual being involved in a presidential campaign. Uh, that first transition of, of writing and, and thinking about public policy, to me, the big the thing that struck me there was coming from Wall Street, particularly from the hedge fund side of Wall Street, which is uh, you know, you're dealing with the market going up and down every day, uh, timeliness and rigor and, and intensity of the analysis extremely important, and you're deep diving into new uh, sectors, new companies all the time, building expertise in a very short period of time in, a, in an area where you may not have known anything before. Uh, and the level of rigor you're doing that to be predictive, right, because there's billions of dollars at stake, you're betting money on, on the outcome. You compare that type of, let's call it epistemology, to what you do in public policy, it's completely different, right? The, there's, first of all, in, in, if you think about academia and also uh, presidential campaign policy analysis and, and even some think tanks, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a sleepiness to it. The rigor of the analysis is not as, as strong, and the quantity and rigor and quality is also not as strong. So I think, to me, that was surprising when I would argue with lefties on things like, say, health outcomes in the Medicaid program. I was also always surprised at how poor their methodologies were uh, in, in how they would advance their case. Uh, so that was that was step one, and I'd say step two in terms of being involved in presidential campaigns. I, I actually will say that I, th I thought the the Romney campaign was actually incredibly well organized, and I was very impressed. Uh, by uh, by the discipline and and the structure compared to what I'd what I'd seen and observed from the outside and other other uh, similar enterprises, I think the one thing about political campaigns in general, and it's especially true of presidential campaigns, it's hard to really appreciate from the outside. Is, you know, you see these guys on the news all the time, every day, and you you think that you assume that there's this gigantic organization that's looking at everything from every angle and has got incredible inputs into data and what's going on out there and making very scientific decisions about what to do. And it's actually not like that at all. It's basically three guys in a room and another five people on an email chain kind of bouncing ideas off each other and figuring out what to do. So you have these incredibly consequential enterprises, presidential campaigns, which are w in which the decisions are being made by a very, very small group of people uh, with, with often not that much more input into how to make those decisions than a lot of outside observers. I think to me that was probably something that, you know, seems now obvious being involved in a long time, but at the time I'm like, wow, you know, you, you never really think about that. But, um, you know, Wall Street people would ask me, so what's, what's it like being involved in presidential campaigns uh, compared to being in Wall Street? And I'd say, it's just like Wall Street. On Wall Street, there might be 10 shareholders in a particular biotech company, and we're all wondering how they're going to buy or sell their shares based on a new clinical trial that comes out. In a presidential campaign, there's, instead of 10 shareholders, it's 10 operatives uh, who, are, uh, who are making decisions, and you're kind of uh, going based on that. Great. And, and I guess especially from, from a policy perspective, you know, I think policy may be one of the places where real life and a West Wing episode are, are most divorced. Um, you know, I think people like to picture 
policy kind of driving the campaign train, and it's probably, it's more like policies like in the trunk, thumping around, and every now and then they open the, the back and let you see the light for a few minutes. Um, I'm curious, I mean, Ulvik, obviously, Grant seems to have sort of, he got his fill and ran the other way in a sense, whereas you keep coming back for more. Um, and I'm wondering how you thought about how to be effective in that yeah. context and, and how you adapted, how you think about it and, and what you've seen works and, and doesn't work. Yeah, great question. And, and, I, and I've had uh, a pretty different, you know, the, ro the roles have been different. So in, in the Mitt Romney campaign, I, I was, you know, very kind of bottom of the org chart, just kind of helping out where I could be useful. Uh, in the Perry campaign, I was, uh, you know, the third highest ranking person in the campaign. So, uh, and then in the Rubio situation, I, I'm an external informal advisor, but, but perhaps more, uh, more involved than I was uh, with, with Romney. Um, you know, what I would say is that often what happens in, in political campaigns is the policy guys are, I don't want to say looked down upon, but they're kind of like the nerdy guys in the corner <laughs> who are sort of like, okay, you go play with your toys over there and we'll call you when we need you. Uh, but they're not trusted to be involved in the core decision making because the assumption is that they're thinking in their think tank heads about the ideal case of, well, we should just have you know, this ideal system where everyone, you know, for example, let's, say, let's call it a flat tax. Like, everyone should have a flat tax. That's great. And the political guys say, well, that's great that you want a flat tax, but we're going to get hammered because that's going to effectively be a massive tax cut for the rich and, and a huge tax increase on the lower, you know, the, the poor uh, workers, and we're going to get hammered on that. So a, a lot of times the perception is that policy guys don't sufficiently take into account the politics of, uh, of policy. And I think what was really uh, great about the role I had in the, in the Perry campaign is that uh, from the beginning, there was very much a, a trust there where they, 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 felt, uh, they felt confident that, um, that I understood both sides of that, that I w obviously would strive for the ideal policy outcome, but that I understood uh, the political sensitivities and the importance of having public support for your ideas and would try to synthesize those priorities and also the communication side of it. Uh, in, in ways that, that made sense for the overall uh, success of the, uh, of the enterprise. So that's, that's something that, that is a case by case. Some campaigns, there really is that trust. I think w with, with Mitt's campaign, I think Lonnie had that trust and, and, and could have influence on, on how he did things as a result of that. With other campaigns, it's not like that where um, you know, the policy guys are just this kind of shop where you call them, okay, the Zika virus is, uh, is, is coming out, what do we do about that? Or, you know, some guy just, you know, th there's often things that happen in the news where you're responding to news cycles, you're developing proposals, um, and those proposals then get, that get worked on and become part of the, the overall platform and the agenda. Um, but uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a very, it, case by case. I would say Marco is a guy, Senator Rubio is a guy who is, is very wonky actually and really cares a lot about policy and so it's been probably a more important part of his operation than it is say for a guy like Trump. Um, but it really is, it really is about the candidate and, and about perhaps the, the people at the very top of that org chart who either because of their experiences ha trust policy guys because they work with guys who they, who they feel get that or they don't because they've had bad experiences. And it, and it really can be a case-by-case -case thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess the only thing I would add, if you think about a, a presidential campaign, again, sort of like an organization, um, you know, where are the big drivers, right? Big drivers are finance, so fundraising, political, right? So you know, basically figuring out how to tell the people in given sort of, you know, demographic what it is that, you know, how you're going to help them or how you're good for them, and then communications. Right, and Oren's an analogy of sort of policy bumping around the truck really is pretty accurate. Right, I mean it's sort of these nerdy you know, policy guys sort of hang out in the policy shop, and you know someone drops by and says we have an issue with such and such. Tell us what we should what we should say. We go tell them something, and then they may or may not say what we told them. Um, but and, and so and and I don't know sort of how that contrasts with actual governance. Right, I would hope that once you know you become sort of the governing party, that would be different. I'm not certain it always is the case. Um, but certainly in a, in a campaign environment, um, you know, it's finance and political and comms, in my opinion, that really drive you know, the campaign, which you know, partly is why I think you see a lot of success, you know, at least right now, with, with, with Trump, right? I mean, he's, I think his comms are really, really strong. I mean, he tells a story, right? And he has a narrative, and people hate it or they love it. But he's saying, you know, he's telling a good message. You look at, you know, at, at Jeb, 
and really probably strong on policy stuff, but he's got no, you know, no one picked up on his message, right? And so it's, you know, policy is not always a driver in the campaign cycle. I sure hope it is in governance. But no, we'll it's, it's a great example of the Jeb Bush campaign, uh, you know, because the Bush campaign actually has an incredibly strong policy operation. They have about 200 people working for them, organized into like uh, 20 different working groups, and they've put out white paper after white paper after white paper on various very important policy problems, and I'd say 19 times out of 20, the team will put out this incredible, dense, 10-page document, post it on a blog, and then literally nobody writes about it. Um, and that's and that's in a sense like you, you salute them for, for putting out thoughtful uh, public policy proposals, but it, it is very important to connect that with with what your campaign is saying and doing, uh, and and that's and in, particularly in a primary, which Republican primaries are not policy oriented. I think Republican voters in particular are more ideologically oriented than policy oriented, meaning they care about whether you love the Constitution, uh, they care about your fidelity to uh, to certain values. Uh, they're not as concerned about the ins and outs uh, of your views on marginal effective tax rates. So I mean, does obviously everything is viewed through the Trump lens at this point in a sense, but is does Trump give lie to the very idea that it's worth having a policy shop? You know, I think I saw yesterday he got asked a question about what are you going to do about student debt? And his answer was, we are going to take such care, good care of the students. Don't you worry. <laughs> Our plan is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and honestly, relatively speaking, that is deeper than many of his policy answers because it's, <laughs> it's at least internally consistent. Um, Especially in this cycle, you know, you've been with a couple of the campaigns. Have you seen? Is there any value to be gained from having more to say about it than that, or would candidates maybe even be better off trying to say less about it at this stage in a process? Well, I think one thing we should we should remember. I mean, we're we're talking about this cycle as if it's this exceptional thing, which it, it is, of course. But let's not forget that in 2012. I mean, there was kind of a clown show that that was running around in that race too. I mean, uh, nine nine nine. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> Herman Cain was a great guy. You know, I mean, terrific guy. Nine 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 had a lot of appeal, but the workability of his tax plan was actually uh, quite difficult to to work out, right? So, so we saw quite we we saw pretty similar dynamic in terms of the policy debate uh, in, in the primaries in 2012. Again, I just think Republican voters are not they want. Uh, here's what I would say. I'd say that. Policy debates matter incredibly in the general election uh, because, again, as, as you will remember, Orrin, very well in the 2012 race, uh, Mitt Romney's tax plan was savaged by certain uh, left-leaning think tanks, and the end result of that was Obama ran around saying Romney is going to raise taxes on the middle class, and even though that was totally not true, uh, because a credible think tank on the left said so, uh, uh, that ended up being part of the narrative. and so. If you don't have a wealth, uh, if you haven't filled in those blanks, the left will fill them in for you. So I think there's a there's a level of, I'd say the ideal level of detail in a general election is enough detail that you can re anticipate and rebut the criticisms of the other side, but not put out so much there that you're just creating targets for yourself unnecessarily. And you also want to leave some room for Congress and the voters and uh, and to, to refine and and, and fill, flesh out the details of the policy. In the primaries, it's different. I think in the primaries. What you're doing is you're laying the groundwork for that that greater detail in a general election. So you, ha you you're building an operation where you're thinking about these issues so that what you say in the primary is consistent with the more fleshed out version you talk about in the general, and you're also trying to communicate to the voters you're trying to appeal to how that collection of proposals and themes and policies orient your and What are your priorities? What are your priorities? If you're running for president. You have the ability to focus on 20, 30, 100 different issues. What are, you really have to focus on three or four things that you really, really want to do. And so a big part of, I think, a, a well-structured policy operation in the primaries is that it really helps the candidate illustrate what his priorities are and also lay the groundwork so that you're not getting out over your skis and saying something and promising something in a primary that in a general election you realize, oh crap, why did I say that? Now I'm going to have to live by that and Hillary's going to savage me. So a big part of what you do is in a policy operation, I think, to be structured is to um, make sure you're thinking ahead and 
and, and making sure that the, the, the promises and the, the, uh, the, the, th the themes and the, and, the, and the rhetoric you use is consistent uh, and, uh, with, what, uh, with what you say when you're fleshing those proposals out later on. Yeah, I mean, my opinion on it is, you know, in every campaign and every candidate sort of looks at it differently, right? And there's a couple of ways, right? You can look at policy as offense, right? Which I think Jeb's group, I don't know, but I would think they probably looked at that as a really strong, you know, point for them. Turned out not to be the case, it seems like. Um, or, you know, the way I bet Trump sort of thinks about it is policy is sort of defense for him, right? I mean, he'll only start talking about policy if he really gets backed into a corner. And if people accept that he's going to say the students are going to love it and it's going to be the most incredible thing, great. Doesn't have to play defense. You know, not a whole lot more sort of policy thinking that has to be done in the short term on that, right? I agree that you, know, you get into the you know, general and it's going to start you know, making, you know, it's going to start becoming more and more important. The other piece um, to your comment about the Romney tax plan, um, you know, the narrative again, and this may be really obvious, you know, policy is important but it's the narrative, right? It is the story. It is the way that you take that message and whatever that policy is, because nobody, you know, your average voter doesn't think real hard about marginal sort of tax rates and that kind of thing. It's how do you tell the story in a way that's meaningful to them and they can understand. Because they are not going to sit down, you know, go to some website, download a 20-page white paper and try and digest it. It's just not going to happen. And so you have to be able to drive a narrative around it that makes it really easy to consume. Should we move to questions? All right, I'm being told to move to questions. But one more question for Grant first. Yes. Um, so just from the outside then, you know, at this point you're, you're at a tech startup essentially with a bunch of tech startup people who may or may not talk about it around the office. Sure. Um, what do you have to correct them on? I mean, what do you think that people, <laughs> or when you're at Stanford, what, what, are, what, is the, what are people in the business community most misunderstanding as they watch this play out? I, I, I think people assume, and this was certainly the case when I was in school, people assume that, um, you know, similar to what Avik said, they assume that it's sort of this group of, you know, people that have, you know, dotted every I, crossed every T, know exactly what's coming and have thought through everything, and that is absolutely wrong, right? It is not. There, there are very intelligent, smart people in there, but they're consuming information at just about the same speed that sort of the listeners are consuming. And so it's a lot of shifting on the fly. You know, there's a whole lot of mistakes being made, a lot of things that are sort of being said and thought about that you know, certainly aren't correct, right? And you know, people put forward, and then you, know, you have to walk things back, and you know, a lot of fact checking going on. I mean, you would be shocked by the number of hours that you know, political folks in campaigns spend time just thinking about whether or not the candidate actually said something was true, and how can you make it true based on new information. <laughs> um, so it's really a, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound dismissive of it. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it is a wonderful, fun experience that I would never do again. <laughs> Unless somebody asked me to, I probably would. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that note, I guess the microphones, I guess we'll start with this microphone. Uh, thanks. Uh, Joseph Hanna from UC Berkeley. Um, so obviously Berkeley Tech, uh, there's a narrative that uh, President Obama's campaign uh, grew or um, was effective because of predictive analytics and a lot of big data technology that they use in that space. To what extent uh, could you comment that that was true and has the conservative uh, campaigns, um, you know, learned from that and are starting to use that? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Um, and and it, what's important to know, I'll say a couple things. First. The balance of power on that stuff has shifted over time. So in 2004, when George W. Bush was running for re-election against John Kerry, it was Karl Rove uh, who, uh, and his team that had a huge technological edge over the Democrats on analytics. And it was actually in response uh, to Karl Rove's, Karl Rove's team was the one that effectively invented what we now think of as micro-targeting. Uh, in, in his case, it was finding the NRA supporter and getting his NRA supporters, you know, getting his, his, him to find all his other friends who were in the NRA in his neighborhood and getting them to turn out uh, for George W. Bush. So that was one of the, the, the really the, the first campaign in which a lot of these technologies were used. 
And then uh, the Democrats and, and Obama, learning from what Karl Rove did in 2004, took it to another level, and then another, another level, still, uh, level still in 2012. Uh, so Democrats have definitely uh, built on that. Uh, I think what you've seen now from Republicans is they're starting to catch up. Are they exactly uh, where the, the Democrats are? I think the Democrats still have probably an edge over Republicans on this stuff today because they've continued to invest and you have people like Eric Schmidt and a number of other uh, people in Silicon Valley who, because the tech culture has leaned left over the last 10 to 20 years, have, have, have been involved in much more in, in, on the Democratic side of things. Having said that, uh, there has been a significant improvement uh, on the analytic side uh, on the right to the point where while it's not as, as good necessarily yet as where the, uh, the de Democrats are, the edge has, sh the, the margin, the gap has shrunk. And when the gap shrunk, shrinks enough, it becomes less decisive in an election. So perhaps analytics were worth three percentage points in the 2012 election. Uh, in the 2014 elections, it was actually Republicans who did a lot with micro-targeting and won a lot of uh, elections that were close as a result. I think in 2016, my bet would be that it's going to be neutral to max half a percent in terms of the Democrats' margin uh, from technology. Hi, Anne-Marie from Wharton. Um, my question is around public sentiment, and given that public sentiment is um, for capitalism roughly equal to socialism, given the recent um, lash back against the 1%, is it possible for a presidential candidate with a business background to win the presidency? And if so, what would it take? So another way to ask that is what could Romney have done better and what is Trump doing right now with his background that's been effective? Well, you know, I, I said actually just after the last section, uh, session to Bill Kristol, you know, I totally agreed with what he said about uh, the fact that Republicans have not done a good job of responding to the events of 07 and 08. Um, and, and I remember, and, and, and Oren, probably you can talk about this, I remember in 07 and 08 thinking, wouldn't it be great if, if Mitt came out with a, a great plan for Wall Street reform? Because here's a guy who actually not only is, is a business guy, but incredibly fluent in uh, financial markets and could have, uh, could have really put forth a very thoughtful plan on Wall Street reform that would understand how the financial system works and reform it in, in a better direction. Uh, and, and my understanding uh, from, uh, from the guys upstairs was, was that uh, the political guys had done polls saying that um, swing voters didn't care about Wall Street reform. And for that reason, it wasn't, it wasn't something that, uh, that the team wanted to invest in. Uh, to me, that was, uh, that was you know, I think, obviously hindsight's always twenty twenty. but it seems to me that given that Mitt had this stereotype of being this banker business guy uh, and that was seen as sinister, kind of like the way Trump has been so-called, so, you know, quote unquote, a traitor to his class, if, if, if Romney had had a, a very thoughtful plan on Wall Street reform, that could have helped uh, be an antidote to that, to that image that uh, the Democrats had painted on him. But I don't know if you have yeah, any well, thoughts on that. I mean, that. that was somewhat in your portfolio. Yeah. Um, so, so I actually dealt with that issue, right? So I covered economic issues and financial, Dodd-Frank financial regulation was one of them. Um, and, you know, had lots of conversations with lots of Wall Street folks about, you know, what we should say and, you know, how to structure it and actually put together a pretty compelling Wall Street sort of financial reform package. But, you know, the reality is, you know, that is a generally going to be, in terms of public sentiment, a losing issue for someone trying to say, hey, let's not regulate quite as much, particularly given what had just happened leading up to it, right? But I think the second point about what could Romney have done, um, the strategy on you know, Romney's campaign was there's a whole bunch of these winning issues, right? And then there's losing issues, of which financial regulation is one of them. You know, we're going to go you know, full bore offense on winning issues, the economy, right? It was all about, hey, Obama has done such a dismal job with the economy. You know, we're going to win. It doesn't matter who we are. It's just all about the economy. And the reality was there was all these other issues that you know, Romney was just getting hammered on and didn't play defense, right? I mean, there was not a strong sort of defensive position on a bunch of fringe issues that do matter to people. And so, you know, the original question is, you know, what could Romney have done? Well, I think he could have played defense on those issues rather than just be all offense. Um, what could Trump do? Uh, who knows? Yeah. I think if you're going to be. I don't a, think Trump even knows. <laughs> I think if you're going to be, a, if you're going to run as a businessman, it's very important for you to hold 
the business community accountable for things business does wrong. As, as we've noted many times, there's a difference between being, between being pro free market and being pro business. And, 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 and this whole idea that, well, because I've run a business, I know how to run the country, it's just not true. The Constitution is different from a corporate charter. Um, and, and, and so I think it's very important. And this is why Trump is so successful, right? He's a billionaire. He freely says, yeah, I paid $300,000 for Hillary to come to my wedding. And people respect him for that because he's just being honest about it. And, and he knows what he says is, I know how corrupt the business world is. That's why I can fix it because I'm the guy on the inside who's got it figured out. And again, that doesn't mean you have to have a left-wing program. You can hold the business community accountable from a pro-free market standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would add one other <clears throat> point just from my own experience with it, which is that, you know, I think this really fell into what Grant talked about as the narrative being more important than the policy and that whether or not a businessman is going to be successful running for president is a question of whether at the end of the day the American people like that as his background and, and think that he was a good businessman and, or not. And that fight has nothing to do with what policies he's proposing. It certainly has nothing to do with how he feels about the Volcker rule. Um, in 2012, I think it had a lot more to do with Romney being engaged in a, pro a protracted primary while the Democrats started carpet bombing uh, industrial swing states in particular with messages about you know, the laid off guy whose wife died of cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so Donald Trump has, to some extent immunized himself from it by just being like, yeah, I'm a filthy rich businessman who pays money to people to come to my wedding. Like, what do you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it's also true, I think, that he has not yet been tested on, for instance, his bankruptcies. And as people talk about what, what would actually, you know, I think Bill Crystal talked about what would a really smart, intelligent, well-executed advertising campaign look like. It probably doesn't look a whole lot like showing that he flip-flopped on Obamacare or something. Probably looks like going and finding the people who were laid off as a result of his bankruptcies that he's so proud of and showing what happened to them as compared to how much money he earned on the deal. And so that's, you know, in a context, even in the primary, certainly in a general election, that is more likely to be where people litigate this question over whether his business background is good or not. Um, but in a world where you know a socialist who I think I saw didn't have a job until he was 40 or something can win the Democratic nomination, backgrounds are what, what the candidates make of them. I don't think they're inherently good or bad. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm being told this is the last question. OK. Uh, Andrew Nesbitt, Cornell. Um, my question is, I think one of the most discouraging things that probably a lot of us agree on is that there's just so much demagoguing going on in politics and sadly that seems to be uh, winning you know I mean I look at a guy like Bernie Sanders and I'm still amazed at how many of his supporters don't even know that he plans on raising taxes not just on rich people but on the, the middle class and you tell them that and they're like what you know they're shocked and uh, and it's because they would rather listen to very quick sound bites like the economy is rigged and and things like that and so uh, you know, my question is, you touched upon this a little bit regarding how deep into policy that you go, and I'm wondering if there's ever been discussion around saying, look, we want to take the high road and be like, this is why it's better, and explain on a very deep level. But unfortunately, it seems like there's such a large amount of people that just, whether they're lazy or just don't want to, like, look into it, don't understand it. And I'm wondering if, you know, because you need to convince those people, too, is there ever this thought of let's fight fire with fire and maybe we have to get into this like demagoguing game as well and hope that the means just or that the ends justify the means and whatnot? Well, I'd say, I'd say a couple things. Um, first, uh, you know, there's a great old story about uh, Margaret Thatcher. You know, after they had won a, a number of elections as, as the Conservative Party in, in the UK and then started the slip at the tail end of, of the uh, Thatcher era, uh, somebody, one of her uh, uh, ministers asked her, you know, uh, uh, Madam Prime Minister, why do you, if our ideas are so much better and we, you know, our economy has grown so much as a result of our policies, why does the other side win elections? And she said, my dear boy, it's because they have better rhetoric. Right. And, uh, and, and, and I think that 
I take the other side of your your, your argument. You, you know, you're saying that people are lazy; they're not they're uh, they're not uh, paying attention. I would say it's actually the the mark of a successful country that the vast majority of people in that country don't care about politics. It's only in countries that are engulfed with civil war and massive corruption that people care about politics a lot because it actually matters to their everyday lives much more than it does for uh, for us. The successful countries are countries where the politicians can't affect your lives so much so you don't need to pay attention to what they're talking about every day. So it's the job of a presidential campaign to appeal to those voters by boiling down the message, by making sure you're, you're, you're representing your policies and your proposals and your ideas in a way that really resonates with the average person who otherwise has, has every reason not to pay attention to you. And that's a healthy thing, I think, about our system. Yeah, I think the, the one additional comment I'd make is I think you, I think you have to think about um, sort of voters or the people that you're trying to appeal to sort of as customers, right? And what is the market telling you? You know, what do the customers of, you know, your message, what do they actually want to hear? Um, this room is full of people who can sit down and read those types of white papers and understand them and think critically about it. But I don't think this room is representative of sort of the general public, right? For a number of reasons, right? Partly for what, you know, the reasons that I've said and partly other reasons. Um, and so I think you need to get to a, a time and a place where the customer, right, the market is demanding that, demanding sort of a more critical look at what policy implications are um, before you'll start getting more thoughtful sort of debates in the you know, public at large. But I think we're, you know, as evidenced by Mr. Trump, I think we're a long ways off. Yeah, and in closing, I would leave you all with a question. Who here would be comfortable coming up and explaining to the group the differences in how Rubio and Cruz's tax plans affect your particular bracket. Right, and you're all MBAs at top one, thank you. You know, you're all, and, and you are high information, politically motivated MBAs at top institutions. Um, so to expect, you know, you can say the question of what Bernie does to the middle class is, is a little bit more generic than that, but to expect campaigns to turn on those types of issues given this is, um, is, is never, going to be, never going to be how it plays out, I think. So thank you guys very much. Hope this